Good morning, everybody. I'm Matt Keogh, the Federal Member for Burton. It's great to have you all uh, down here at the William Street level crossing here in Beckenham. And it is my pleasure to be joined by Labor leader Anthony Albanese, WA Premier Mark McGowan, and of course, WA Transport Minister Rita Safiotti. Here in Beckenham, we see at this level crossing at William Street, huge congestion every day. And Beckenham is a suburb like so many around it that is experiencing huge urban infill and population growth. That means the congestion is only going to be getting worse as we see more traffic on our roads here. We're also blessed to have the Metronet project of the Thornley Coburn link coming online in a few years time which will be of huge benefit to our community but of course it's going to put even more trains through this railway line. At the moment this level crossing is already closed for nearly four hours every day. That situation of course will get worse and so it's really important that we address these issues of congestion in our local community to make everybody's here their lives better. And that's something that I've been pushing for, that I know the local government here, the City of Gosnells has been pushing for, the State Government has been pushing for. It's so important for our local community to resolve that congestion and also make sure that everyone's journeys are safer. So I'm so pleased to be able to have uh, Anthony Albanese, our Labor leader here, to make a very important announcement on behalf of our community, on behalf of Labor. Well, thanks very much, Matt, and it's great to be back in your electorate again and also to be joined by the Premier, Mark McGowan, and Rita Safiotti, who I enjoy a long-term relationship with uh, building things here in Perth and throughout uh, Western Australia. Uh, today's announcement is a good one. It's about busting congestion. It's about improving road safety. This level crossing here closes 266 times each and every day. And what that does is hold up traffic. It also is a safety issue as cars that are heading in, in the direction all of a sudden uh, have to stop here each and every day. What we want to look for is to partner with Western Australia in projects that will improve productivity, improve road safety and make a difference to people's lives. And this project here, which will be jointly funded from a federal Labor government that I lead, together with Mark McGowan's Labor government here in WA, will make an enormous difference to this growing community. And I thank Matt uh, for his advocacy in this project. Uh, these bells ringing that we're hearing now 266 times every single day can be stopped. They can be stopped by this investment, and it's an investment that federal Labor and the state Labor government will join to deliver, making a difference, creating jobs as well, while this infrastructure project is built. I hand now to, in a tick, to the Premier of WA, Mark McGowan. Uh, thanks very much, Anthony. Before I comment on this, I'll just give you the latest uh, figures. Uh, up to 8pm last night, we were reporting 7,998 new cases, so just under 8,000 new cases. Uh, of these, 3,255 were confirmed through PCR and 4,743 were confirmed through rat tests, which I think shows the value of our free rat program in WA. To 8pm last night, there were 256 cases in hospital and of those, eight were in ICU, which is a slight reduction on yesterday, which is good news. Uh, overall cases have dropped now to 45,766. We had 15,773 15,773 PCR tests yesterday. There were no deaths reported yesterday. However, there will be three historical uh, deaths that will be reported today of people who sadly passed away in the last uh, few weeks uh, with COVID. So uh, that will uh, be reported today. Uh, today's announcement by uh, Anthony Albanese is much welcomed. Uh, this uh, level crossing here has been a terrible um, blight on the community now for many decades and has caused immense disruption uh, to the lives of people living in Beckenham and surrounding suburbs. Uh, removing level crossings is an important part of our Metronet program, particularly on the older lines such as the Armidale line uh, and uh, we're removing five further up. Uh, we're uh, dealing with Denny Avenue and we're also now um, looking forward to a federal commitment if federal Labor is elected towards this level crossing here. Uh, this one closes up to uh, 260 or so times a day, which obviously is immensely disruptive to local people. And elevating the rail line, creating a new rail station uh, will be a, 
uh, huge quality of life improvement. It will create jobs in doing so. It will make life more uh, and business more efficient in this area uh, and enhance urban infill through here. So all around it's uh, a huge win for Western Australia and I'd like to welcome uh, this commitment by Federal Labor. I'll hand over to the Transport Minister to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Premier. We welcome this commitment by the Federal Labor to remove this level crossing here. As you can see, the existing station is split into two. This is a very, very busy area, and we also want to support further redevelopment in this area, new housing opportunities. The removal of this level crossing will facilitate that. We welcome the commitment, and should our Anthony Albanese become Prime Minister, we'll get onto this project as soon as possible. And, of course, this is part of our whole package of Metronet, which is creating over 10,000 jobs at the moment and also building world-class infrastructure for the future. Thank you. Thanks. We're happy to take questions. Oh, look, the gentleman was associated with uh, the truck uh, that was there yesterday. Uh, this wasn't someone just passing by. Uh, with regard to the Prime Minister uh, yesterday, um, I think that people should engage uh, politely uh, wherever possible. And uh, it is important in this country that we're able to have uh, civil discourse. And it's good that here in Australia we can have uh, politicians get out and about uh, yesterday with the, the Premier, uh, we went to Westfield Carousel for some period of time uh, there in the electorate of Swan. Uh, we engaged with uh, many, many dozens of people uh, during that visit, uh, not just from Perth. There was one fellow who was getting his car serviced uh, from Albany, had driven up uh, from Albany and we engaged with him. It was a terrific opportunity to hear uh, the issues firsthand. Uh, from people, and I'll be doing that as much as possible during this campaign. On Russia, Mr. Albanese, you've previously been lockstep with the government when it comes to Ukraine, but now you're calling for Russian diplomats to be kicked out. How come? And are you suggesting the government is soft on Russia? Uh, no, I'm not suggesting that at all. Um, what I'm suggesting is that the government should consider uh, doing what countries like France and Italy and others in Europe have done which is to expel diplomats in response to the outrageous atrocities that are being committed by Russian forces in Ukraine. We have war crimes being committed. We have civilians uh, being murdered. Uh, we have rape being used as a weapon of war. And we need to send the strongest possible message uh, to Russia uh, and join with our, our allies in Europe uh, who've made this decision. Well, we haven't suggested uh, the expulsion of the Russian ambassador uh, to Australia. What we've suggested is that we join uh, with other like-minded countries in sending a very strong message to Russia. And we make that suggestion uh, to the government. Uh, we have been very supportive of the measures that the government have made up to this point in time. But with the information and the escalation that has occurred, uh, from Russia, it's very clear that Vladimir Putin doesn't seem to be getting the message from the rest of the world. The rest of the world, uh, we are all saying Australians are united in their opposition uh, to the intervention in Ukraine. It's important that we continue to send the strongest poss possible message, and one way we could do that is expulsion of some diplomats. So. Look, it's absolutely important uh, that uh, we have a, a, a ceasefire and a stop to these atrocities. Uh, the truth is uh, that Ukraine is a sovereign nation that's been invaded illegally by Russia. There is no justification for Russia's uh, intervention and for the atrocities that have been committed. And of course, all sides, all sides uh, should engage in, in a way uh, that is appropriate. Uh, there is never any justification 
uh, for uh, the murder of civilians. What we're seeing is uh, ruthless uh, intervention. We're seeing bombing of civilian targets. We're seeing murder of civilians in Ukraine. It, it, call, call it what you like. Uh, it's working with the community uh, to deliver uh, on our commitment. Uh, that's what we will do. Uh, and we've had a number of suggestions uh, made in, in the way in which you could do it. But there's two sides. What you can do is you can sit back and say it's acceptable that there isn't a nurse in every nursing home. We won't worry about the Royal Commission recommendations. We won't try to make things better. Or you can do what we're doing, which is to say that we'll implement the recommendations of the Royal Commission, a central one of which is a nurse in every nursing home. Now, there are a range of ways in which you can do that. One is by attracting people back into the workforce. So it's a constructive suggestion by Seniors Australia yesterday about another way in which uh, you could do that. Of course, we know that in our nursing sector, uh, there's a range of uh, migration issues whereby people can be attracted uh, to Australia. And of course, as well, we've said we'll have 20,000 additional university places. Uh, in addition to that, we'll have uh, over 400,000 fee-free TAFE places uh, targeted at areas of skill shortage, including the aged care sector. Uh, I just find it astonishing that this government called a Royal Commission into aged care, it made very clear recommendations. A nurse in every nursing home, 215 minutes of care, better food and nutrition, better regulation. What we're doing is saying that we will do that. The other recommendation that they made was about wages for people in aged care. We make no apologies for saying that people earning $22 an hour for the tough physical and emotional work that comes from working in the aged care sector is not enough and we'll make a submission of the Fair Work Commission saying there should be an increase in wages for people in the sector. Now, the government will have to fund that whoever is in government. Whatever the Fair Work Commission decides will have to be funded. That is the law. It's not something that's an option. So we have this nonsense from this government, a government that's presided over a crisis in aged care and has no plan to deal with it. Labor looks at the problems which are there and is putting in place mechanisms to deal with the issues that confront Australia and the challenges going ahead, whether that be better infrastructure, whether it be dealing with the crisis in aged care, whether it be cheaper childcare and doing measures to improve people's living standards, whether it be more secure work. For each of those areas, we have plans and we also have a plan here in uh, Western Australia and throughout the Commonwealth that we've had talks about again today, about a future made in Australia. Here in Western Australia, they're making train carriages. They're making things here. And guess what? They'll fit the stations, unlike what's happening under Liberal governments in other states, whereby they're purchasing infrastructure and train carriages and light rail carriages overseas, and they're not fit for purpose. We need to make more things here. That is one of the big objectives that we have a major part of our campaign will be a future made in Australia and we'll be making more announcements about that if ever the Prime Minister gets around to formally calling the election campaign, if ever he decides that he's spent enough taxpayers' money on ads in the lead-up to the election. The five, the five uh, lower house independents have all ruled out doing a deal in the event of uh, a hung parliament. Does that concern you at all? No. I'm campaigning for a majority Labor government and I'm the only person running for Prime Minister in this election uh, who is saying I will uh, seek to form government in my own right. That's what I'm asking for. I'm asking for people to vote Labor. Uh, we've seen Scott Morrison, who's part of a coalition now with the National Party, whereby Barnaby Joyce gets to decide what the climate change policy is for this government. No wonder there are issues uh, in electorates like Curtin and others for people who want serious action on climate change or, or who want a national anti-corruption commission or who want people to be safe and to be treated properly. Uh, this government, uh, at this election, Scott Morrison can't say 
that he wants to form government in his own right because that's not going to happen. It's not the case now. I want to form a majority Labor government and I want to work uh, with state and territory governments of across the political spectrum uh, to have a better future for this country. I, I'm campaigning for a majority Labor government. Uh, that's, what, that's what I'm campaigning for. Will you negotiate with the Greens if you have to vote? No. Will you have to? No. Will you work with independents then? Uh, look, what I, what I will do, and you don't have to theorise about this, I've been the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia. I've been the Acting Prime Minister of Australia. And after 2013, when I became the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, we didn't do, there was then uh, a minority uh, government, we didn't do uh, arrangements with uh, any of the crossbenchers. Uh, we went into that parliament, we said if you want to, vote for the other side and uh, change the government, that could have occurred. Uh, on uh, the, the morning after, I became Deputy Prime Minister. So uh, my position is very clear. Uh, we will uh, implement the agenda that we're putting forward at this election is the one that we will implement in government. Uh, that is uh, the proposition that we have going forward and I'm the only candidate I'm the only candidate for Prime Minister uh, in this election and there's only two of us. I'm the only one who can say I'm seeking to form government in my own right. Why are you running such a tight media strategy? Is it because you think your shadow ministers could be a liability? <laughs> we're, we're running a very clear position uh, going forward. Uh, I'm the leader of the Labor Party. I'm very proud of my team. We will be the most experienced incoming Labor government in history. Uh, Labor has formed government uh, three times since the Second World War under Gough Whitlam, Bob Hawke and Kevin Rudd. Uh, none of those three gentlemen, fine Prime Ministers that they were, had ever served as a Minister. I've served as Deputy Prime Minister, I've served as a Senior Minister in the Government in Infrastructure, Communications, Regional Development, Local Government, a range of portfolios. I've been Leader of the Government in the House of Representatives and chaired the Parliamentary Business Committee and seen through every piece of legislation uh, that was carried during that time and I've been Acting Prime Minister. And we will have senior members of the Government uh, who've served as senior ministers before. Penny Wong has been uh, the Senate Leader in the past and we'll have new ministers like Matt Keogh behind me uh, who've come in as part of the team and people like Matt Keogh and Madeleine King and potentially others as well. Uh, but those two have made a real difference representing WA in the most senior levels of the party and I look forward uh, to them being joined by more members of the WA Labor Caucus. Well, they, that of course is a decision for caucus, and I don't want to preempt that process. But let me tell you, he's done a fantastic job, and uh, I look forward to him serving as a minister. Uh, I, I didn't know Matt. I've got to say, before he ran in the by-election here, uh, I met him first time. I met him, I was impressed, and he's been outstanding. Uh, he has uh, played a, a, a key role in areas like small business and defence. Uh, he'll continue uh, to play a key role, as will other members of the WA team. We have the quality, what we're missing is the quantity. And it's up to the people of WA, and I hope uh, that they send more members uh, from the Labor Party uh, to Canberra. Well, everything stops after the election. That's one of the big distinctions at this election, is that you have a government that is arrogant, that's shooting for a second term, a second decade in office, but handed down a budget where all the handouts and everything else end as soon as people have cast their ballot papers, whether it be the changes uh, to petrol, whether it be the one-off payments to people in aged care, the one-off payments to pensions. What they're hoping is that uh, they may as well have stapled cash to the ballot papers. 
because it all ends. And what we'll see from the government is what we saw in 2014, as cuts to essential services, cuts to support uh, for the states, a return uh, to the sort of uh, values that were reflected in that 2014 budget. Uh, what this government needs to do, and what I aim to do, but they won't, is to have a plan, uh, not for six weeks, that expires at the end of May, we need a plan for this country's future, a plan for job creation, a plan for new industries, a plan to deal with the opportunities that come from dealing with climate change, a plan to make more things here, a plan to address living standards by lowering energy prices and lowering childcare costs, a plan for the country. That's what we have. They have a plan to get themselves through an election and everything all stops straight afterwards. So I will have a constructive relationship with state and territories. I'll sit down. On, we're not getting ahead of ourselves, but we'll sit down and be open to discussions uh, at any time about issues uh, which are of concern. I want cooperative federalism going forward, not the sort of scene that we've seen whereby you have a Prime Minister in Canberra who has described Western Australians as cave dwellers and who sided with Clive Palmer to say that borders should be opened up here. What's your plan for debt reduction? What's your plan for debt reduction? Well, our plan, our plan is exactly as we have outlined. We have a plan to actually prioritise growth and productivity. This project here today is an example of an investment that will produce a return. If you make it so that people don't have to stop 266 times a day, what you are doing is boosting productivity. That's our priority in terms of infrastructure. The reason why we've picked areas like childcare is that it's not about welfare, it's about increasing women's workforce participation, increasing productivity, so it's an investment that produces a return that helps to make a difference over a period of time to the balance sheet. That's why we want to make more things here. So we have more jobs here, we have more revenue uh, generated here as well. Uh, so our agenda is very much uh, for that. We've been responsible in the commitments that we've made. And the other thing that we will do, this is a government that has spent five and a half billion dollars, five and a half billion, more than double the costs of our aged care package that they say they can't afford to give older Australians decent food, but they've spent five and a half billion dollars on the French subs deal that has produced nothing except a torn up contract. They, as we are speaking now, continue to spend taxpayers' funds on advertising for partisan political purposes. They continue to make appointments to government boards. There'll be more today. They'll roll them out today, more appointments of mates to government boards using taxpayer funds that is such an enormous waste. The problem with this government is that it doesn't draw a distinction between taxpayer funds and Liberal Party funds, which is why we need a National Anti-Corruption Commission, why it's something that I will deliver, unlike what this government has done, which has promised it in 2018 and not deliver one. Just a couple more. Well, I'll give you the big tip. Whilst I hope our Labor candidate for Curtin is successful, it won't be the 76th seat that we win at this election if we're successful going forward. Uh, so we make, uh, we make no apologies for the positions uh, that we've put forward. It is true. Uh, it's just a fact that during the pandemic, uh, you had uh, not politics as usual. You had state premiers and uh, uh, territory premiers and indeed uh, chief medical officers who no one had heard of uh, before standing up every day and doing prime time media conferences. You had married, married at first sight broken into with addresses to the nation. That was a time where if you were an opposition leader uh, it was difficult uh, to get as much cut through as you would if it wasn't the case. But I tell you what, the opposition leaders that did get cut through are the ones that were irresponsible 
and the one that didn't put the interests of their state or nation first. Opposition leaders like here in WA, and uh, they failed to support uh, the good actions of Mark McGowan and his government. What I did was put the national interests first. I make no apologies for that. We didn't allow uh, the perfect to be the enemy of the good. We suggested programs like wage subsidies that the government dismissed and said were dangerous at the time. That became JobKeeper. We continue to be constructive. Some of our ideas were adopted like that. Other of ideas, like the fact that it was a race to get people vaccinated, the government ignored. And we know the consequences of that was that the impact of the pandemic was worse than it would have been if the government had shown leadership. So I make no apologies uh, for the way that I've conducted myself as leader of the Labor Party. On the day I became leader, I said I wanted to be known as the Labor leader, not the opposition leader, because I wanted to be constructive and people had had enough of politics as usual. Uh, this government continue to act like the opposition in exile on the government benches. Uh, we've seen, for example, how, how people sit around and think it's clever. I know we'll register albanese.com.au so that we can redirect people to the Liberal Party site. That's their priority uh, because they don't have an agenda that they're proud of themselves and they don't have an agenda for a next term. I have a clear agenda. It's one that I'll continue to advance. Last one. Last, last one. No. Or reducing spending, cutting spending. No, all of our policies are out there for all to see. They're very clear. They're very clear and, uh, and we've said it. And as much as uh, some in the media seem to be cheering for uh, policies that don't exist, uh, they've been ruled out by us. Uh, I can't be clearer. And we'll be, we'll be held to account for the agenda that we're taking in this election. But it's an agenda that will improve people's lives by boosting productivity, boosting infrastructure, by making childcare cheaper, by making more things here, uh, by making work more secure, uh, dealing with uh, these issues, practical measures like 10 days paid domestic and family violence leave to make a difference to people's lives. Uh, we make no apologies uh, for that. It's a constructive agenda for a better future where no one is left behind and no one is held back. Labor's the party that looks after the disadvantaged, but we're also the party of opportunity and aspiration. We want a better life for people. We want people to aspire to a, a better life for the ki their kids than they themselves had. That's my life story. That's my life story, and that's a good thing. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Well, it was clearly Lisa Harvey and Zach Kirkup and... Mike Nahan and uh, now uh, Mayor Davies. Um, I'm trying to remember who else there's been. Um, yeah, there's been a number of them. Uh, no, Mike Nahan, sorry, Mike Nahan, Lisa Harvey, Zach Kirkup, David Honey. And Mayor Davies. And Mayor Davies, yeah. Quite a few have objected to what we've done along the road. We've had, you know, two years of most difficult periods since the Second World War. And all the Liberal Party did in Western Australia was undermine and criticise, and they continue to do so. Uh, it's quite tiring, to be honest with you, and they don't seem to learn the lessons. Um, what occurred in South Australia, of course, is you had an opposition leader who was constructive and positive and worked with the government to keep South Australia safe, at least until the South Australian government unfortunately opened the border too early. Uh, and uh, people rewarded that. Um, in Western Australia, the Liberal Party doesn't learn the lessons. And I might also add about them, they can't manage money. They can't manage money. We saw the last Liberal government in Western Australia took debt from around $5 billion to $44 billion over the forward estimates. Uh, my government has arrested that and reduced debt, as the only government in Australia reducing debt. You might recall when Tony Abbott was elected, he said there was a debt and deficit disaster when it was about $200 billion. They've now taken it to nearly a trillion dollars, a trillion dollars of debt, and they're claiming to be good financial managers. It's wrong. It's wrong. People need to actually look at the record of when they're in office. They cannot manage money. Premier, this is yet another infrastructure project, a major one in a market that's already really hot. We're struggling to get labour, we're struggling to get um, materials. Is this a wise uh, move to, to be doing, to adding this to the pot? 
Well, yes, it is. Um, as you can see, you can hear the uh, bells going off all the time. It's terribly debilitating for people in this area. Uh, and we want to make sure when we do the major project on the Armadale Line, we get the whole job done at once. This level crossing was named in a media release put out with the federal government back in 2020. Is the, is the funding not guaranteed? I'll let... Uh, I'll let... Well, it's, okay, it was for assessment. <laughs> I have no idea what you just said. She's wearing a mask and there's a train going past. <laughs> so I couldn't even lip read. Um, look, we hope so. Uh, I think, that, as I said yesterday, I think the next week will tell. So over the course of the next week, we'll work out whether or not we're past the peak. Uh, that will give us a good indicator on where we're going. But the hospitalisation numbers are slightly down today. Uh, the reported numbers are slightly down today. Uh, we'll see where we go over the next week. Are you surprised that that research out in the community didn't find any 400 gram percent? Well, I was slightly surprised, but also heartened by that. Um, I think that's actually good news, uh, because what that indicates is our rat testing regime and our PCR testing regime is working. And as you know, we're the only government in Australia that have given households free rats across the board. Uh, and uh, that's obviously paying dividends. Premier, following the federal budget, you said you were disappointed with some of the health funding. You said that the deal to share the cost of COVID between the Commonwealth and the states should be extended. What will you be asking Anthony Albanese for in that respect while he's here? Well, I think Anthony just answered that question. Oh, sorry. I think you see the reason why we need this uh, level crossing <laughs> fixed. Uh, incredible stuff um, and very, very annoying and uh, debilitating for people in this area. Um, look, obviously we'll work with Federal Labor if they're elected uh, on all those issues. As you know, Labor in government funds health uh, more strongly and better uh, than the Liberals and uh, obviously they have a plan for Medicare and a plan for health and work constructively with them. Just on some of that. I don't think so, because now that international and interstate borders are open, our recruitment is far easier. And so we've got major recruitment campaigns now going on uh, around Australia, and indeed we're going to be looking more um, vigorously around the world to attract nurses into our hospitals uh, in Western Australia. So we hope over time it alleviates the problem. Just on the telephone modelling, they've predicted that if masks are lifted before Easter, there could be a rise in cases of by 15 per cent and deaths by at least 17 per cent. Is that further justification for you that it needs to be sticking around throughout the winter? Look, we haven't made a final decision on how long they will be in place for, uh, but that will be dependent upon the health advice that we get. We know that masks work. Uh, they reduce the spread of the virus. They reduce the pressure on our hospitals. We'll make a final decision on all of that, um, or a decision on all of that, uh, as time goes by. And I can't be definitive. I know everyone wants us to be definitive at every point in time. But what you find is if you are too definitive too early and circumstances change, then you have to change your position and people get upset by that. So we will um, we'll make a decision on that as time goes by. But we do know that masks help reduce the spread of the virus. Uh, Telethon, Telethon Kids Institute this morning said they're not calling uh, for masks to be lifted uh, for uh, right now. So uh, we'll continue to monitor the situation. No, they, they commented this morning. They've been on ABC Radio saying they're not calling for it to be lifted uh, at this point in time. Should that be the first cohort? Uh, well, we can, uh, we can consider that based upon health advice. Just, I just remind you all, uh, whilst it's you know, the advice we got, the written advice we got from the Chief Health Officer was keep it in place for children eight and over in inside locations outside the home. Uh, so, you know, not at home but in other locations. So that's the advice we followed, and that's in place in schools because it reduces the prospect of children infecting their parents, their parents being furloughed from the workforce, uh, reduces the prospects of children becoming ill and having to stay off school, uh, and it means that they're not close contacts. So that's why we've got it in place. I think it's all very understandable uh, at this point in time, whilst our case numbers are high. John Quigley, John Quigley is going to be back in federal court tomorrow to correct his evidence, obviously highly embarrassing. Is that going to make his job as Attorney-General untenable? Uh, well, I can't, uh, just on your first point, about 
uh, him going to court, as I've said to you repeatedly, uh, the, the, the advice I have uh, from our lawyers is I can't comment on anything to do with that. But I just make the point, John Quigley has been an outstanding Attorney-General. He was responsible for drafting the laws uh, that helped save this state $30,000 million when Clive Palmer brought an action against our state. So on that basis alone, he's done an outstanding job. Is that enough to save his job? $30,000 million. $30,000 million is what Clive Palmer was on the verge of uh, uh, receiving, subject to a decision by an arbitrator from Western Australia. So, so I'll finish my, what I'm saying. $30,000 million. $30,000 million is what Mr Quigley, combined with myself, uh, pre prevented our state being held liable for. $30,000 million is a lot of money. I think I've answered your question. Capacity limits are soon to be dropped in a week's time. Will that still go ahead in cases that may harm us? Yeah, the advice we, uh, the, the position we took, uh, I think, was correct. Uh, April 14, I think it is, uh, the 500 person limit will be removed. The two square metre rule will stay in place, and uh, if you're not drinking or eating, the requirement to wear a mask will stay in place. I think that's the right balance. Well, we always, we've always known that our situation is very different to other states. Uh, they've peaked. They've had, I think Victoria's had five waves. We've had one wave. And so, um, and our wave has come whilst we have the highest vaccination rates in Australia and probably the world. Just so you know, our third dose vaccination rate is now well above 76%. Uh, and of eligible people, it's easily the highest in Australia. So uh, it's around 86% of eligible people have had it. Uh, other states are 20% below that. Just so you know, Victoria and New South Wales are down at like uh, in the mid 60s of eligible people have received their third dose. So, in other words, the measures we put in place, whilst unpopular with some people, have worked and they've saved countless lives and they've meant that our experience with COVID has been far less debilitating and far less deadly than the eastern states. So, look, um, we'll continue to deal with the situation that we confront, uh, but the, all the signs at this point in time are very positive. Thank you very much. What's the time frame for this project? Is there a South East government? Secondly, uh, we know that the Albert Airlines is going to shut for about 18 months from next year. Is it going to extend that shot down? Thanks for the question. Yes, look, if should um, Anthony Albanese become Prime Minister, we'll be working as fast as possible to complete the detailed design. We have a concept design and we'll be negotiating with the existing contractors but also other contractors to ensure that this project is built alongside the other projects during the 18 month shutdown. So you don't know for sure though? Oh, we'll make it happen. Yes, it, yes it is. So there was a proposal at that time to have this Beckenham station included in the other five level crossing um, removals. That didn't happen. So this is very, very important because this allows us, should Federal Labor win the election, get on with the project straight away. We can either work with the existing contractors or go out and have another contractor. But the actual aim will be to make sure we do this alongside the other projects. Has the business case for this been completed? Have you asked the federal government for money? This is part of the wider business case that was completed. And as I said, there was initially the concept of, in a sense, three and three. Um, and then it went to five. Um, and that's why this one dropped off. But this is really important, and as we can see today, 266 times a day, the, uh, the boom gates come down. And also, if you look at where it's positioned, it's the only level crossing between where the Thornley Coburn link joins the Armadale line and the city that would remain if we don't remove it. So we're really pleased with this announcement. But have you formally asked the Minister for this money There would have been um, previous requests, yes. Have you, how many options did you go through again when deciding to shut the line down for 18 months? Well, as we um, noted yesterday, that I think in an answer to Parliament, that we're at the preferred proponent stage in relation to both projects, the Byford extension and together with the um, level crossing removal through Victoria Park in Cannington. So we have, we're in constant negotiations and we haven't actually awarded the contract. That being said, what we did is we, um, the team from PTA together with the Metronet team worked with the preferred proponents to identify which was the best option for both 
the commuters but also the entire community. We actually went out early and that's why we've gone out um, in February um, to the public to ask about replacement services. So we probably went out earlier than um, would normally be the case, but we did that. So we can survey all the passengers and actually understand what other replacement services we need to bring. We understand this is a massive, massive project, but as you can see, this area, it needs more housing, it needs new train stations, and also it needs to remove that level crossing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For me. Do you have any concerns about security and lighting at the Rockingham train station in the wake of the sexual assault? Look, I don't have concerns about security and lighting. I go there regularly. In fact, I was there this morning. Uh, and uh, there's a great deal of security and a great deal of lighting already in place. I do know that the, um, uh, the police uh, did... Um, put a huge effort into apprehending that offender and they put enormous resources into it. Thanks very much. Thank you.